Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Maladumim, Israel. The so-called art of persuasion is one of the most advantageous of talents for a person to have. To convince others of something that they don't necessarily want to be convinced of is frequently nothing short of a miracle. People can be quite stubborn. It is one of our most natural tendencies learned in the early years of life. Persuading somebody else or even oneself to think in a way that they don't really want to think and to get them to actually act on that persuasion is the work of either a con artist or a true master. Persuasion involves making clever use of that greatest of all human tools, the ability to to communicate our thoughts to others. This originally took the form of certain gestures, which eventually evolved into language and speech. To this day, language remains our most wondrous creation, the work of hundreds of thousands of years that reached its pinnacle with the invention of, of writing. Long before that epic event, human beings were speaking to each other in a manner that a very intelligent animal could barely envy. It is a true miracle if we really think about it. Our thoughts are our own, and they populate our very private universe. To communicate them to others is to travel between universes. As amazing as communication is, persuasion goes a step further. It attempts not only to communicate one's thought to another, but to get that other person to change their own thoughts. How could such a thing even be contemplated? Thoughts and beliefs are our personal treasures. They should be hoarded like gold. To allow another person to manipulate those thoughts is to sacrifice the most precious reflections of ourselves. But as we all know, this happens all the time. We do it to others and we allow others to do it to us. It is an essential part of living with other people. We all realize at some point that this is the way things have to be. We are really not individuals isolated in our own cocoons. We are more closely compared to a network of minds, each having its own memories and thought patterns, but regularly interacting with many others to glean from their ideas and to inject our own into theirs. There are two general ways of going about this process. The first, which is the most natural and probably the oldest by far, is that of compulsion. To twist the arm of another person, whether in actuality or figuratively, is about as human as it gets. We are very particular about other people listening to us, so it makes sense that we would resort to force to get them to go along with whatever we want. The tried and true method of doing this is physical force. This is where all manner of fighting and wars and violence stems from. It is not unusual that things can work out for the better when this method is used. But it's just as common that the person who was compelled in some way never really bought into whatever was forced upon them. They just gave up the fight because it wasn't winnable. The other method is to actually persuade the other person with words and ideas. When it comes to practical things like budgets or getting things accomplished in the house or on the job, this can be very simple and very easy. When it comes to deeper and more personal matters such as love or religion or life choices or anything to do with money, things get a bit more complicated. This is where the skills of a master persuader come into play. It is not just anyone who can convince another person that their idea about God is correct, let alone demonstrating how much they care about that other person or getting them to hand over their hard-earned pay. The Bible has all manner of persuasion in it like any classic work of literature should. There is God trying to persuade Cain, and Abraham or Moshe trying to persuade God. There is Moshe working his hardest to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, and Pharaoh constantly hardening his heart and refusing to be persuaded until his proverbial arm was twisted so that he could no longer refuse. This week's Parsha even has a case of Moshe and Aaron attempting to persuade a rock. The Parsha is called Hukat. That word means law of. It introduces a section that seems to have nothing to do with the rest of the Parsha and nothing to do with anything else in the entire Torah. It is a rather long description of a series of laws having to do with what is called the Para Aduma, or red heifer. This was a perfectly red cow that was specifically raised to serve as the central ingredient of a very strange process to achieve a form of ritual purity. It involved purification from contact with the dead, which in biblical times was considered to be the highest form of spiritual impurification. 
The only way to rid oneself of the impurification was to sprinkle water into which the ashes of this red cow were mixed. If this sounds bizarre, it is because it is. This is about as strange a law as can be found in the Torah. Following this relatively small ritualistic interruption, the narrative restarts with the Israelites journeying through the southern and eastern areas of what is now Israel and Jordan. The fact is that in, in between this weird para aduma law and those journeys, there is an unmentioned gap of about 39 years. Apparently nothing happened during those 39 years that was worth mentioning in the Torah. So nothing is recorded of them. This is something that many people who, who are otherwise quite familiar with the Torah are entirely unaware of. Those 39 years simply vanished from biblical history like they never happened. Following that gap, the next big event is the death of Miriam, the sister of Moshe and Aaron. This is followed by another classic experience of a lack of water. The usual complaints arise, and God tells Moshe to take his staff and to speak to a rock so that it will bring forth water. Moshe then takes his staff, as he was instructed, gathers everyone in front of this rock, or more likely the rock face of a cliff, and makes a short speech. He chastises the people for their complaints, calling them rebels and asking if they think it is possible that water will gush forth from this apparently dry spot. He then raises his hand and strikes the cliff twice with his staff. Lo and behold, a great amount of water gushed out so that everyone was able to drink. Rather than this ending on a happy note, Moshe and Aaron were themselves taken to task for their role in this incident. God tells them, quote, because you didn't believe in me to sanctify me in front of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this community into the land that I gave to them. The Torah then states that these waters are called Mei Merivah, the waters of contention, where the Israelites disputed with Hashem and where Hashem was ultimately sanctified. The rest of the Parsha deals with the journeys through the lands of Edom and various nations further north. The Edomites refused the Israelites' entry into their land, threatening war if they tried to come through. Right after skirting around the kingdom of Edom, Aaron died and was buried on a certain mountain south of the Dead Sea. Next, there is a confrontation with the Canaanite tribe, followed by an encounter with snakes in the desert. The snake attacks end when Moshe is divinely instructed to make a copper replica of a snake that somehow heals the people who were bitten. After this, there were more wars, this time with nations that live just east of the Jordan River in what is now Jordan and the Golan Heights. The Israelites had to pass through the territory of the nation of Moab around what is now the city of Ammon. This encounter will be explored in more detail in next week's Parsha. Getting back to that thing with the water and the rock face, what really happened there? What did Moshe and Aaron do that was so deserving of this harsh punishment? This is one of the classic questions on the Torah. There are many answers that have been advanced over the centuries. The problem is that what they did doesn't seem to be all that terrible. So they hit the rock instead of speaking to it. The bottom line is that the plan was successful and everyone got their needed water. Who cares how they accomplished this impossible feat? The only clue we have is that Moshe and Aaron were divinely told that it was because they didn't believe in Hashem that they were being taken to, to task. Apparently, this lack of belief or faith resulted in Hashem not being sanctified to the appropriate degree. But this just begs the question. They did believe, at least enough to go to the trouble of hitting the rock. They certainly sanctified Hashem in some way, since the Torah states explicitly that Hashem was sanctified there. The classic way of attempting to answer this question is to focus on the difference between the command to, quote, speak to the rock and what was actually done striking the rock twice with the staff. This, it seems, somehow demonstrated a lack of belief or faith and a lost opportunity at sanctification of God. Some go further and say that it was all over the fact that Moshe hit the rock not once, but twice that was the crux of the issue. Others focus on his little speech, calling the Israelites rebels for their complaints about the lack of water. There are a number of possibilities here, but none of them really seem to demonstrate the crucial point of a lack of belief. Perhaps it is a matter of examining the power of persuasion. This was a rock after all, and it seems that it was going to produce water somehow or other. It was a matter of using the event as a learning experience. Moshe was told that the way to do this was to speak to it. 
Instead, he whacked it a couple of times. In the end, it worked. So that should be all that mattered. But it wasn't. Any event in life, and certainly those in the Bible, should be seen as opportunities to grow in some way. The epitome of this is to grow in one's understanding of God and the role that God plays in our lives. If we can persuade ourselves that God is real and intervenes in our lives, we have practically moved mountains. Sometimes it is simply a matter of moving a rock. This is what happened here. They were told that all that was needed was a little bit of persuasion and the rock would do what it needed to do. Rather than persuade, they used force. It got the job done, but it lost a perfect opportunity for demonstrating that God's intervention can be found with a few words. When Moshe hit that rock, he took the easy way out. Perhaps he was frustrated. Perhaps he was grieving over the loss of his sister Miriam. But the bottom line is that he hit the rock instead of persuading it with words. It worked. Everybody had a nice drink, and they promptly forgot about God. Perhaps their punishment for this lost opportunity was in and of itself a brilliant example of how God is as real as the water we drink. Perhaps that was how God was sanctified in the end, regardless of the mishandling of the rock. Persuasion is always better than force. Shabbat Shalom.